The Pentagon released a new nuclear arms policy last week, which calls for the introduction of new weapons. While this ends President Obama's effort to reduce the size of nuclear weapons and defense planning, the Pentagon insists that it remains committed to the global elimination of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. Tonight, we are joined by Thomas St. Louis and Majore to talk about what this means um, for international diplomacy. Both of you, thank you for being here. Hey, thank you very much. So first we'll go to Sabrina. What are some of the big changes that we can expect as a result of this new policy? So the biggest change is that we're getting away from the policy of denuclearization that we had in the 2010 nuclear posture review. And we're moving towards modernizing our nuclear weaponry. Specifically, the posture is outlined plans to first invest in sustaining our nuclear weaponry and then ultimately invest in modernizing the weapons and the infrastructure of our nuclear weapons overall. And another big point is that there are going to be two, uh, or really an introduction of two new weapons that we're seeing. First is that we're going to see the introduction of uh, low yield nukes on submarine based uh, missiles. Now what that means is now when you think low yield, it doesn't sound uh, perhaps as serious, but it can inflict about the same level of damage that the Hiroshima bombing did. So this is extremely significant with the capacity that we're talking about. We're also uh, looking at uh, a reintroduction of a missile that was actually uh, kind of scaled back a little bit under George H.W. Bush and completely eliminated from our arsenal under uh, President Barack Obama, which was the submarine-based uh, cruise missile. And that's something that's a little more long-term, but those are uh, really two new developments that we're going to be seeing. And Sabrina, why implement this new policy now? What's the timing of this? So the nuclear posture essentially pinpoints Russia and China as sort of main causes for our need to advance our nuclear arsenal. They specifically say that since the 1980s, which was the last time we modernized our nuclear weaponry, China and Russia have been extremely aggressive in modernizing their forces. And so in order to compete with them and ensure that we have a policy of deterrence that's strong enough to compete with Russia and China, we have to be modernizing our weaponry. So that policy of deterrence and that following sort of the same sort of mantra of being prepared. So what are kind of the global implica implications in terms of policy and conflict that, you know, are prompting this uh, new development? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, I mean, the last time we even looked at this policy was 2010 when we decided that we were going to scale back uh, on some of our nuclear advancements. Since then, uh, just like Sabrina said, you know, you've seen advancements from China and Russia who have continued building their nuclear uh, weaponry. So some of the global imp implications, I mean, critics have pointed to, you know, could this start an arms race? Um, they, they've also pointed to the fact that um, this policy might not best equip the United States when it comes to negotiating with other countries to scale back on their nuclear weapons. On the other hand, uh, proponents of this have quite frankly argued the opposite. Mm -hmm. They've been saying that by increasing our nuclear weapons, that'll give us a little more uh, perhaps strength uh, when, we, when we come to the table and it will you know, perhaps uh, persuade Russia and China to, to scale back a little bit more, showing what we're capable of. A policy of deterrence that ultimately we haven't really seen people scale up with in, in a modern era outside of the Cold War. So it certainly creates uh, this dichotomy where we don't exactly know what it's for, but it's entirely necessary in order to remain competitive on a global scale. Absolutely. And one thing to note, though, in light of all of this, we still have to remember that there's a New START treaty that's in effect right now, and that will be in effect until 2021, February 2021. And that's a treaty between Russia and the United States that sets aggregate limits on our nuclear weaponry. So we are still limited and are, according to the posture, going to be abiding by this treaty until there's further changes. And, and Thomas, what about the White House? Have we heard anything from them on this matter? Um, at the moment, there actually, we, we heard about this back in January. That was the first time we heard about it. And one of the reasons that people have had a little bit of concern about this and what some of the critics have been saying is Trump's had very strong rhetoric, especially towards uh, North Korea, saying that we were going to respond with fire and fury, uh, fury. And critics are saying, you know, is this kind of that step? Um, on the other hand, uh, you've seen out of the Pentagon, they're, you know, trying to assure people, look, the end goal is to, you know, pretty much denuclearize um, the world, but it starts with the United States kind of leading those efforts. If this is the first step towards the denuclearization, we'll definitely be paying attention to the next. Both of you, thank you for joining us. Hey, Thanks thank you very us. much.